So um, thanks to everyone for, for joining us here today for this uh, noontime seminar sponsored by Subtle Medical. And it will focus on the impact that deep learning techniques and artificial intelligence can have in the uh, imaging enterprise. We have a slate of robust speakers, present company excluded, somewhat less than robust, and who will go ahead and take us through some of these concepts and hopefully give you some really good examples as to the impact that this technology has in day-to-day -day practice. I see a few folks getting ready to sit down and we have a couple of seconds you know, to wait until we hit the top of the hour. So I'll give them a chance to uh, sit before I move on to uh, introducing our next speaker. Our next speaker is one of the founders of uh, Subtle Medical, Dr. Greg Zaharchuk. Uh, he is a professor of radiology in Stanford University and, Stan and, and Stanford Healthcare. And we were just reminiscing about the time he came up to me. He says, Larry, you know, you, you have a reputation for efficiency. I have this tool I want to talk to you about. And uh, by the time we get to the end of the middle of this presentation, you'll hear how we rolled this out in the largest outpatient imaging network in the US. But at this point, I'm going to hand the stage over to Dr. Zahartrick, and he can go ahead and start his presentation. Thank you, Larry. And I, I sincerely apologize for the lunch. And I'm very hopeful, especially for myself, that the lunch shows up uh, by the end. So bear with us. Um, so the mission of Subtle Medical is listed here. It's to accelerate the world's access to higher quality health care through faster, safer, and smarter medical imaging. And this is a company that was founded out of Stanford University and went through the Stardex incubator. Uh, Dr. Enhal Gong uh, was a PhD student of mine uh, and is now the CEO and you know, has put together a fantastic team over the last four or five years. Um, and uh, we're going to be showing, you know, some of the progress here today. And I think really it's the beginning of a very long road. So we have two FDA cleared products. Uh, the first is Subtle MR, and this is the second generation. So we've learned a lot from the first generation, and the second generation uh, is described here. This is an AI-powered software solution to accelerate, uh, enhance the quality of MRI protocols through two methods. One is denoising and the other is by increasing sharpness or super resolution. Uh, and the benefits of the version two, it applies to both 2D and 3D sequences. So if you're using one or the other, uh, you know, we use a lot of 3D at Stanford, so this is really quite essential for us. It is FDA cleared for 99% of MRI procedures. Uh, so pretty much anywhere in the body you wanna use it. I tend to show neuro examples because I'm a neuroradiologist, but you know, be aware that you know, this can be used outside the brain. The goals are improved image quality and improved throughput. And I like to always put some of the references here uh, because one of the things that I think distinguishes different companies is their willingness to publish their work and to do prospective studies. And I just highlight some of the prospective studies here um, in case you're interested in looking at any of them. Subtle Pet is our other FDA cleared and CE marked product. It is also in its second generation. And this is AI powered software that can denoise low count pet images. Uh, and it's very flexible because you can reduce the time by a factor of about four, or you could reduce the dose. Or you could reduce the dose by two and the scan time by two. So many people use it in a very flexible way. So uh, these are the benefits, improved image quality, of course. And I, I apologize for the very small text about the radio tracers. When this was first approved, it was a small list of radio, radio tracers. But it has increased over time as PET continues to adopt new and useful tracers. And I would just highlight uh, the ability here to look at uh, gallium-68 type uh, studies, such as Dota Tate, which is this example, and PSMA. Uh, which I know are increasing in use in many hospitals. And again, some of the references to prospective studies below. So I get asked, how does it work? Uh, so this, uh, one of the really important things when we started the company was that we thought there was a need for a vendor neutral type uh, solution because you know, every vendor will give you a solution. Uh, it may work with some of their software. It may not work with all their software. But most people have more than one vendor or maybe might buy more than one uh, type of scanner over their lifetime. So we really needed to make sure that it worked with all different scanners and clients. And the basic idea is that images are acquired uh, rapidly or at lower dose. Then these are pushed uh, just like you would push a scan to PAX, but instead you would push it to the subtle uh, virtual machine. 
And this processing can happen on site. It can happen in the cloud. It's much more robust in the cloud. And I highly recommend using the cloud if you can. And then the enhanced images are then placed back into PACS and the radiologist reads it. So there's really no disruption to the workflow. Uh, and you know, ideally at a site, um, you know, the radiologists are just going to be getting better quality images and don't have to deal with all the logistics of, of how to do it, moving to other workstations, et cetera. Uh, so what are the values for these products? Uh, there are a bunch, and we just show four here. Um, you know, the most critical one for a lot of sites is workflow efficiency to reduce wait times, increase scanner capacity. Um, some sites use it to improve image quality. So if you have a different range of quality of scanners, you might want to be giving your radiologists uh, very similar quality images so you could improve image quality. Uh, to me, one of the things I really liked about these products when we were initially thinking about this was that it really faced the patient, right? This is where we touch the patient. And if we can do shorter scans, you know, that's appreciated by the patient. And I remember one, very clearly, one of the first PET sites that we went to, uh, we had a patient where their scan was reduced from about 20 minutes to five minutes. And this patient said, oh, you know, that's great for me because now I can lay flat for that time period. Otherwise, I needed to be in like this special position because of pain. A lot of our patients, you know, when we're being scanning them, they really can't tolerate this. And, and we actually did a survey, and you'll be happy to know that 100% of patients prefer shorter scans. So, um, And then another thing, maybe not to obvious, is that this can extend scanner life. If you can improve the quality of scanners, uh, you can actually even delay upgrades if your plans are to upgrade, and you may end up with better technology down the road. OK. So I don't have to tell people in this room, this is solving a global urgency. This is um, some stuff from Canada and the UK, but this is you know, equally true in the US now. Uh, wait times at many institutions are six to eight weeks. You know, this says 2020, uh, and you can tell it's already post-COVID from the masks, but you know, it's only getting worse as we bounce back from COVID, and we have a lot of studies that have been delayed. And you know, everyone knows imaging uh, value is increasing, so we're doing a lot more of it. So uh, just a few numbers, um, and just to you know, shout out some of our, our partners. Um, we're deployed in over 400 sites globally. Uh, we've saved about uh, 2 million minutes. So in case you're wondering how long that is, that's about 3.8 years. And, it, and that's very meaningful to me, because this is like time we've given back to patients. So that's really important. And then I also firmly believe that you know, as we spun out of a research institution, you know, we need to you know, write up our results and have them in the peer-reviewed literature. And so we've really encouraged publication. And just want to thank all of the, the people who have um, you know, been the early adopters of this technology. You know, very briefly, we, we're lucky to work with a lot of great industry partners. And I'll be talking about some of these people as we go on. But I really just wanted to um, you know, say thank you to these people. And you know, we, we really enjoy and learn from working with them. Uh, over time. OK, I want to spend the rest of the time I'm allotted to talk about the future. Because these are the products, to me, these are the engines that kind of drive the ability to develop more products. Because I think we're at the beginning of a very long road here. And I want to show you some of the things we're thinking about. And uh, this is just uh, kind of some of the timeline with Subtle Pet and Subtle MR on the left. I'm going to talk about uh, these four other products that are in our pipeline Subtle Synth. Subtle GAD, Subtle IR, and Subtle QC. And one of the things that we've been lucky to do is also attract funding from the NIH to do these studies and, and work also with um, academics to develop them. OK, so um, the most immediate is Subtle Synth. This is FDA pending at the time. And this is just the beginning of a long line of synthetic products for us. Uh, and what this product does is it uses deep learning to synthesize new MR contrasts from existing contrasts. So I like to call this 100% acceleration. And in many cases, you actually end up with higher quality. And in this case, um, we've started out with uh, synthesizing stir images of the spine from sagittal T1 and T2 weighted images. And the reason that we get higher quality, as you can see in this picture, the acquired stir on the left, the synthesized stir on the right, is that STIR is naturally a low SNR technique, right? Because you have to do an inversion pulse to knock down the fat signal. But if you're using two high SNR T1 and T2 sequences to build it, you actually have improved image quality, as you could see on the right. 
Um, and you know, one of the things to point out is this is applicable to all spine imaging, which is often 20 to 30 percent of volume at many sites. I like this example. This is um, a stir image in a patient with an um, expansile bone lesion uh, shown here. This was a four-minute scan on the scanner. You can see some hardware at the bottom as well. Um, you know, and, and this is the, the, subtle, uh, the subtle synth product, you know, and it was an acquisition time of zero. And the other thing to think about is, um, you know, one of the advantages of synthesizing data is the potential to acquire data uh, in patients who may have motion degradation or may even leave the scanner before the images are acquired. And so I want to show you this very confusing slide with a lot of pictures on it. But this is kind of an idea of what you can do in the brain with subtle synth. Um, and this is the idea of missing data imputation. So the idea is, so just to break down this plot, so if you go down the leftmost column, there's a T1 image, there's a T1 post-contrast image, there's a T2 image, and there's a flare image. And these are the images that were acquired uh, by the, the, the scanner itself. And then each of the rows going across is the, this contrast being synthesized from a group uh, or a subset of the images that does not include that image, right? So what it actually means, you know, to describe like, let's see, like 001 means that this T1 image was synthesized only from the flare. And this was synthesized only from the T2. And if you go all the way over here, this scan was synthesized with all three of these contrasts, but just missing this contrast. So, the idea is that if patients move, if patients uh, can't tolerate the rest of the scan, we're going to have the ability to synthesize that data going over. And I think one of the interesting uh, rows in this column you might see is T1GAD. So you know, remember, all of these images were synthesized from contrast from images that were acquired before contrast. And you can see that you know if you only have a flare to use to reconstruct, you don't do such a great job. But if you have all of the pre-contrast yeah, imaging, you actually do a pretty nice job. Uh, and I think this is one of the, the future uh, aims, uh, not just for you know, producing gadolinium images from non-gadolinium images, but just for any case in which a sequence didn't go the way it was planned, which happens you know, not infrequently. I want to talk next a little bit about subtle QC. And this is the idea that we can use deep learning to measure and quantify image quality. We can also determine whether protocols are complete, and we can ensure that techs are actually covering the entire field of view in real time, and make sure that they don't send an incomplete study that may require callbacks or may require disruptive phone calls to radiologists to figure out, should I repeat something, should I not repeat something? Uh, and this is kind of an example here. You know, this kind of picture might get a check mark. This is a, a quality image, no motion, high SNR. This is a low quality image, patient moved you know, we may want to recommend rescanning that patient, for example. I want to briefly talk about subtle IR, and this is an NIH grant that was funded um, to basically do this for radiography and fluoroscopy. And uh, this is an example of a full dose uh, fluoroscopic image on the left, and then fourfold dose reduction on the right. And this is good for the patient. Obviously, low dose is good for the patient. But it turns out what it's really good for is the operator, because the operator has to stand there the whole day. And they're always getting radiation backscatter. So this reduces their dose. They don't have to stop working if they go above a certain level. Uh, the other thing is this is a great technical challenge for the team, because this is real time. We have to be able to do inference at 30 frames per second. And I think it's fantastic that the team has uh, solved this problem. OK, um, I want to talk lastly a little bit about gadolinium. And I think you're all familiar with the, the situation around gadolinium. Um, I think NSF has been largely solved by macrocyclic agents. But now we know that even in patients with normal renal function, that gadolinium deposits in the body. And you know, a lot of patients get repeat scans. We definitely see this. And we, have, we see, definitely see people with patient concerns. You know, so we have to deal with those. So how do we do that? Um, you may also be familiar with the potential for contrast shortages. This was a big issue for ionated contrast recently, when a uh, center in Shanghai could not supply the US with contrast, and there was a lot of scrambling going on. So again, if you could use less contrast, that would be a nice thing. 
Uh, and I just want to show you some of this work. Uh, this is some of the earliest work in the company has been centered around being able to synthesize full dose contrast from low dose, and in this case, 90% reduced dose. Um, and so for me, you know, I think when we hear the term Alara as lowest reasonably achievable, we think about it radiation, but we really should think about that much more broadly. Like how much do we need of anything? How much do we need of contrast? How much do we need of imaging time, et cetera? Uh, one of the things we've worked really hard on is generalizability. So if you worry about things in AI, one thing you should worry about is how well does a technique that um, works in one site work under other conditions. So we've spent a lot of time looking at a wide range of imaging vendors, a wide range of acquisition parameters, et cetera, to try to make this as robust as possible. And we'll be starting clinical trials with uh, several sites in the US on this product in the fall. I guess the winter by now. Uh, the last thing I want to just talk about is something I've realized over the last couple of years is that um, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, interest in uh, the environment, and I hear a lot of interest around the radiology community about our environmental impact. And a lot of these tools really do uh, have value in that space. So I just want to start with this picture. Does anyone know where this is? You want to shout it out? I know you're hungry, but... Well, I know there's some, at least some people from France here, but this is the Mer de Glace Glacier in, off of Mont Blanc, a very famous glacier. Um, and basically, that's what it looks like today, and just some pictures of what it looked like in 1919 and then recreated today from the same vantage point. So I think it's really imperative for us to think about ways that we can reduce our uh, use of electricity and carbon emissions, et cetera. And this has been picked up by a lot of groups. This is a slide from the ACR that uh, is nice work from Julia Schoen. Uh, and it's, you know, the text is really small, so I don't expect you to read it all. But you know, one of the things that's mentioned there at the end is the use of AI to shorten MR protocols. And that, you know, that's fundamentally what we're trying to do uh, in the company. So that makes me happy. Um, the other is um, the issue of gadolinium. You know, we've been very successful with MR. We're growing the number of scans, but we're also growing the amount of gadolinium that we are then putting into the wastewater. So I think this quote uh, is pretty damning. The increasing use of gadolinium-based contrast agents for MRI is leading to widespread contamination of fresh water and drinking systems. And you know, six-fold higher over the last 24 years. You know, this is not a week that goes by without a publication coming out on this topic right now. And you know, it's journals that I don't usually read, like the Journal of Marine Pollution. Um, but this is important. Um, and you know, gadolinium is unsafe um, when dechelated, and wastewater plants basically dechelate um, even macrocyclic agents. Uh, and then so finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some actual numbers. And some of these numbers are really surprising to me. So if, if you read, if you got a chance to read the ACR slide, you'll know that about 10% of uh, you know, uh, carbon emissions in the US are from healthcare. But the surprising thing is that 0.5% of all carbon emissions uh, in the US uh, come from MRI scans, which is a surprising number. Um, and that a single 3T MRI scan basically consumes enough energy to power a household for one day. So, I mean, when you start to add up how many scans we're doing and how many more we're doing, um, you know, it makes me really happy that we can address some of this. So I, I show two scenarios in the upper left. One is if you use a 1.5T magnet instead of a 3T magnet. Um, you know, that is uh, significant, you know. We're using the 640 tree metric. Um, if you have three 3T scanners and you, instead of adding a fourth, you just use subtle to improve your workflow, that's an even bigger change. So um, again, you know, it makes me very happy that we're addressing this issue. I think it's gonna become more and more important. And uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that uh, I know is very important also to the team. Uh, and you know, it's very important for the future of radiology. So I would have normally asked for questions now, but I'm gonna stop and I think we're taking all questions at the end. So I'm just gonna hand the podium back to Dr. Tannenbaum. Thank you. Thank you, that was a wonderful and uh, provocative presentation. Um, my name is Larry Tannenbaum. I think I might have introduced myself before. I am a neuroradiologist and chief technology officer for RadNet, which is a large, the largest outpatient imaging chain in the U.S. And I'm going to review some of the things, you know, with more like show and tell than the beautiful exposition you heard from 
um, like there's a hard treat beforehand. So we'll talk a little about the learning reconstruction. Really my main point is to show you how we've rolled this out in this large imaging network. And then we'll talk a little bit about the works in progress and some of the work that we've been involved in in doing the reader studies for the subtle synth that you heard about beforehand. So at this point we pretty much know what deep learning reconstruction can do. It is clearly an emerging standard of care. What it does for you is very, very powerful denoising. I think you have an impression of that already. It does this while preserving or increasing the sharpness and spatial resolution. By improving the SNR, you improve the contrast resolution, but all of the time you do all of this while maintaining the quantitative and qualitative integrity of the image. And every once in a while you can reduce artifacts. Now at this point, you can't miss walking around the booth to know that the OEMs have products in various stages of evolution, but we are here to talk about something that works on every scanner. And for Redden, this means all the scanners that are too old for the OEM upgrades. And that's quite a few scanners. The nice thing about Subtle MR is it is DICOM based. Uh, it's uh, post reconstruction. And uh, it is, again, universally applicable at field strengths and uh, models. And it produces this kind of a benefit where you get really, a, when RADNET does this, by the way, we always aim a little higher in our image quality. So it's always a little better image quality, often at a lot of time savings. And you can just see typical examples from our institution of the kind of stuff we did beforehand on our older machines that we do now on our newer machines. And I think it's hard to argue that that's not an improvement in our standard of care. This is from some of our research. You can see standard of care on the left. The image when we just accelerate it and the typical negatives that we get when we accelerate. By the way, radiologists love noise. It's one of my favorite topics of all time. You see this little graininess here, you know, this little salt and pepper. We love that. If we don't see that, we get nervous that we're losing information. Okay, but the only difference between this and this is we scanned it less for a shorter time. This is noise, ladies and gentlemen. We don't really want that noise. By the way, if we take this image and process it with subtle MR, you get an image that looks very much like the standard of care. Now, we recently published this work. I am one of the et al's in this particular paper. Um, that uh, Dr. Uh, Zahartrick mentioned beforehand, but we actually showed that you could use uh, subtle MR to accelerate our routine protocols and actually produce a slightly better level of image quality uh, across the board. This is the routine image. This is what happens if you accelerate it. There's all that salt and pepper that radiologists love, as well as a decent amount of image corruption you see here. This image process with subtle MR gives you an image that very much approximates what you see there. Here you see the same thing with T1, standard of care, fast image with the routine reconstruction. Again, look at all that salt and pepper in the noise pattern. And without that noise, you get an image that looks very much like the routine sequence. Now, it's not just denoising with subtle MR. There are some circumstances where they can leverage the deep learning techniques they can that can increase spatial resolution. Here's our routine scan, 30 slices. If we decide to go faster, we end up with a softer scan. Maybe higher contrast to noise, but it's a softer scan. But I can learn, that the software can learn this resolution, teach it to this image, and get this image coming out of the machine roughly one minute later. So we can actually get images that are very much like the original image, maybe even better, um, in a lot less time, and that's really a compelling piece. Again, in 3D techniques, you can see the impact. It really is quite striking. Same scan time, just process with subtle MR. We go from there to there. When we actually looked at this scientifically in an abstract, we went roughly with 30% acceleration. Here you can see the routine scan day to day. We actually softened it up to go faster, but then we can actually learn this resolution, teach it to this image, and actually produce an image that is clearly better than the standard of care. Again, one more time, standard of care here, in this case looking pretty good. Accelerated scan clearly looking a little soft. Process scan looks absolutely spectacular, and frankly, I think fairly exceeds the standard of care. Now, if you look inside the circle, you see there are two lesions here, two subcortical lesions. You don't see them here because the contrast to noise isn't as good. Okay, but notice that when I drop, when I increase the voxel size, I increase my contrast resolution. And even though I have accelerated, excuse me, I've increased the spatial resolution through deep learning, I still maintain that contrast resolution. And I've seen that on multiple occasions. Now, again, I mentioned we maintain the quantitative integrity. And another paper I did with Dr. Bash uh, showed that when we accelerated our 3D images by 60%, we still maintained our quantitative integrity. And this was actually last year's Ant Mini image of the year. But most importantly, we showed that we got the same quantitative numbers when we did volumetric assessment, when we did, looked at the accelerated sets that we did with the um, uh, routine standard of care sets at uh, much longer scan times. 
So Dr. Zaharchuk mentioned what you get out of this, you get a virtual system upgrade, you know, without the need to do all that CapEx and turning the system down. It essentially reduces radiologist stress by actually making your old systems, which make fairly ugly images, look just like your new systems making pretty images, and that's across the board, something that you can see. You can see it applies in all types of applications. Standard of care, accelerated noisy scan, new standard of care here in the middle, roughly two minutes saved per scan. Another example, this is off of Philips. Again, accelerated scan, looking a little rough. Uh, process scan looking really much better, in this case saving three minutes per scan, just one more example, just to show you that it's vendor agnostic. So what they were hoping I would talk about today is how we've deployed this, and frankly, we identified 139 high priority sites in our network from multiple different vendors. Uh, thus far, we've actually uh, employed this at 102 sites, and you can see where they are across the board, you know, West Coast, East Coast, Mid-Atlantic. If you look at this data and you can't see it, it's probably too small, but I would say that right now we're averaging about 21,000 exams processed per month across our national imaging network. And you get a sense of what we've saved, you can actually see the number of minutes saved and the, and the percentage saved. And we looked at our West Coast protocols, and again, we allow our radiologists in each individual region to use this tool the way they like. On the East Coast, we actually got even greater savings, but if you conservatively estimate what we said, and when I saw Greg saying two million minutes saved, they say, we've saved two million minutes. So those other 399 sites probably saved a little extra so if you look at what we've done, we, did it, we started in 2021. In 2022, we estimate at today's current rate of 21,000 added on to the rest of the year. We're going to do close to 200,000 exams this year. That's roughly, as an estimate of six series per exam, 1.2 million series. If I conservatively estimate 1.25 minutes per scan, and that's really conservative, based on the numbers I gave you, we saved this year 1.5 million minutes. If you look at when we get these sites on on uh, line by the end of the year, we should approach 30,000 exams per month, which means that we will save almost two and a half minutes per year. How do the radiologists like it? Well, Dr. Miller, a neuroradiologist, I think she clearly loved it. I won't read all of her comments. Um, uh, and you can see, she basically said, look, the clinicians love these images, the radiologists love these images, it's a big plus. We actually have some of our administrators saying, look, I was getting a lot of grief from the doctors that the images weren't good enough, they wanted me to shut down the scanner. We don't have the money to upgrade it, what should I do? Well, Subtle MR took this scanner from being a problem to one that was doing 20% more volume and met all the radiologist's needs. These are big, big impacts in a big enterprise. Dr. Bash, who you've heard a lot about today already, you know, she made these comments about what she saw when she was out reading these on the West Coast in her clinical practice and showing you better sharpness, maintained image quality, greater detail. It's a big plus, and you can actually see, you know, the kind of things we see. This is what we aim at. This was the standard of care, this is the raw scan, but notice when we process with subtle MR, it is hard to argue that this scan in two minutes isn't better than this scan in almost four minutes, and that really is the key point. Now with this speed, you get uh, a smaller carbon footprint, you get a better patient experience, but when you're putting on your economic hat, you're going to get enhanced workflow. You can take 20 minute slots to 15, uh, getting a 33% increase in throughput, you can take 30 minute slots to 20. Again, getting a 50% increase in throughput and roughly, really roughly estimating the ROI, we're looking at something around 7x in our institution. So this is a really easy investment to do things like getting more capacity. We all know what's going on with the mass resignation. We're in urban areas, urban flight makes a difference. We have had circumstances where we could not staff our scanners long enough to get these exams done. Now we can get these done in one shift as opposed to two, two shifts as opposed to three. Uh, we stay on schedule. The patients like it better. 100% of patients want a shorter scan. I like, that. I like that quote. I'll just use you as the source there, Greg. Um, and again, less motion, less recalls, and essentially letting your scans live longer. And uh, it's a key point. So I've got a few minutes left to talk to you about what we've learned from the reader study with uh, subtle synth. And you've seen this. We essentially can synthesize a stir-like image from the T1 and the T2. So this is the way it works. We actually use the T1 and the T2 to make an image that looks just like the original stir. That's the original stir. This is a synthetic stir. Osteomyelitis and discitis, I think a very reasonable representation of the reality in this case. We actually did, we're about, right, about to write up this particular manuscript looking at it, uh, uh, all disease states with this particular tool. And we used a neuroradiologist, MSK radiologist, an MR reading, MR, radi MR reading general radiologist, 
and we put them, these through the comparisons, and as you might expect, based on what you've seen so far, the images were fundamentally interchangeable, but gave you better quality with less artifact. And here are just some examples. A couple examples of bone tumor. Greg showed you this case. Here's another case. You can see here, I think, a very reasonable representation synthetically of what we have with the traditional scan. This is a case, another one, where you can see we've got uh, a, a, a lesion involving the upper sacrum. Again, the stir image is deteriorated. It has poor SNR. It has motion. Look at what we get from synthetic stir. Okay, in these circumstances, I think that's pretty cool. Now, looking at a number of different disease states, myelopathy post-op, the myelopathy here from inflammatory, you know, transverse myelitis, again, beautifully rendered, I think, in both of these cases. Now, there's a separate manuscript we're looking to write, uh, looking at the separate trauma subset, and here you see a nice trauma case. Again, the original stir, the synthetic stir, really nice matching of the actual extent of disease and uh, conspicuity of disease. A couple of other cases with a lot of post-traumatic changes. Uh, again, the synthetic stir doing a very nice job emulating what we get with the traditional stir. And again, even in the trauma setting, we got roughly the same results. Better quality, excellent emulation of what the stir actually brings us. Now, again, to show you examples of the benefits here, you see the SNR benefits. Why is the SNR higher? Just as you heard earlier, it's calculated from the higher resolution, higher SNR, T1 and T2, not the stir that we struggle mightily to make look pretty. So again, you don't, it's not a surprise that you're getting these individual benefits. Individual exams where the SNR of the subtle stir is better than the original stir. Again, artifacts, a little bit of motion, a little bit of truncation, less of a problem with the synthetic stir calculated from the pretty images that I showed you earlier. Again, with trauma, again, the real trauma case, really pretty images here with less artifact and an excellent rendering of that data. Now, you know, a bit of an MR geek, this is one of my favorite benefits. You know, you, the, the susceptibility artifact is less. And this is not some magical effect of the subtle reconstruction, although, you know, they may very well figure that one out. But when you actually do a stir scan, you do a lot of things to get signal that increase your metal artifact, okay? But if you take an image created from the scans that don't make those efforts, high bandwidth, uh, excuse me, low bandwidth and like, you end up with a lot less metal artifact. So because we can extract these from scans that are done at higher bandwidth, we get less artifact. This is one example. This one's even more striking. I mean, you can actually see the screw here because of the fact that this is done from a T1 and a T2 as opposed to a stir when we have to pull out all stops. So um, that was a bit of a whirlwind through show and tell, but I think, I think I've given you a real sense of how reliable this has been. A couple million, you know, a couple hundred thousand exams per year, how valuable it is for our patients and our enterprise, and as you heard, as for the environment. And at this point, I'd like to hand this off to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Mr. Lou Masella, who is a vice president of uh, PET CT and radiation oncology at the Shields Health Group, and he will take over uh, with his associate uh, to go through this next presentation. Thanks, Dr. Sandman. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Zaharchuk, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I want to thank uh, Subtle Medical uh, for the opportunity for us to share a little bit of the uh, Shields Health story. Um, I do have with me today Haley Camerata. She is the uh, Director of PET-CT Operations. I am the, uh, the head of the program and Vice President uh, for uh, Growth and Development of our PET-CT program. Um, and, but I really want to take a minute and thank everybody that's here, and it looks like we did more than pack the room. We got some people standing. Thank you. And I want to thank you for a very specific reason, because when I signed up for this, and I'm guessing when you signed up for this, we did not know what the World Cup schedule was going to be. We did not know that USA would be paying, playing right now. And so a couple of ground rules, folks. You can, you can watch on your phone if you want, but if you're feeling like you're going to have a celebration, please take it out in the hallway. All right? So all goal celebrations out in the hallway, if you don't mind. Excellent. So here we go. So Shields uh, Healthcare is a medical imaging and outpatient surgery company. We're located in the northeastern United States. Um, for the PET-CT component of what we do, we are 18 locations strong. So everything we do is in a mobile environment. We run four trailers in the states of Massachusetts and Maine. And this year, we're going to see 16,000 patients doing that, uh, doing that work. So four trailers, 16,000, 4,000 scans per trailer. It's a pretty busy operation. And we are constantly looking for the ability to become more efficient, et cetera. Um, our partners are academic medical centers and a mix of community-based hospitals. But I'm, I also want to share with you, and I'm very excited, that uh, as this meeting wraps up this week, 
Uh, on Thursday, we hit our 20th anniversary of being a PET CT provider, and it's a pretty exciting time for us. So um, good stuff happening where we are. Um, you are going to hear some common themes, and one of the things the speakers did not do this morning is kind of share notes and say who was telling which jokes. I think the, the, uh, the World Cup one's going to be unique, but we are going to talk a lot about patients wanting less time on the table, and I'm going to actually get you there. So. But we do think of an immense amount of time about the patient experience. It is one of the most important things to us, and we use a platform called Podium to measure our experience with our patients. Um, we've been using this platform since February of this year. We've got 61,000 responses across our, uh, our product lines. Um, and our uh, net promoter score is a 96. Now, if you're not for familiar with what a net promoter score is, um, it can range from negative 100 to positive 100. I don't know all the math, but you take the people that love you and you subtract the people that don't love you and you end up with a number. So if you're thinking about it goes from negative 100 to a positive 100, we're doing okay at 96, right? And we love that number. We want to maintain that number. And again, we focus on that number a lot. Comparatively, other radiology-based groups that are using the same platform are ad averaging a 75 net promoter score. So yay for us, okay? Um, but through this tool, we get a fair amount of live of, uh, feedback about what we're doing, what we're doing well. They say, I love our, we love our techs. They say, we love the process that we have. We get them over the concept of being a mobile environment. Uh, but the one very current uh, uh, recurring theme is, if you could change anything, I'd love to be on that table a little less long. If I could get out of that camera faster, let's do it. Okay, so this is where Subtle Pet comes into play. and. Um, we have a couple of challenges working in the states that we work in, and I want to run you through a couple of bullet points here, but um, I, I mentioned that SHIELDS operates in the states of Massachusetts and Maine. Uh, Massachusetts and Maine are both heavily uh, regulated states when it comes to um, providing these types of services. We have a determination of need in Maine. We have a certificate, I'm sorry, in Mass, we have a certificate of need in Maine. And if you're not familiar with these programs, what it means is you get the opportunity to have a really intimate uh, relationship with the uh, the Department of Health in that state, and we know it to be a very empathetic and efficient system. Um, that is sarcasm. And so um, we have to go through this process, and we're going to likely on the backside get the approval to do some some type of imaging, PET-CT imaging. I can tell you that in, in these states to um, apply for a full-time fixed PET-CT is a very lofty goal uh, and not common unless you're a hospital that already can prove that, they're, that you've got a need. And more often than not, SHIELDS, when we're applying, um, are applying for either a day a week or multiple days a week in a mobile environment. So that brings us to the mobile model. We like the mobile model. We've gotten really good and efficient with it. Again, the patient's experience with it is that they don't even really recognize it's there. Um, and uh, it, it solves both the, the regulatory piece as well as being able to manage the cost of a piece of equipment over multiple partnerships. So we like it. Um, but, you know, as I just mentioned, we're 20 years as a PET-CT provider, not every year, but we filed that DON a, an eon ago, and we're probably growing out of it, right? So we know, what do we know about PET-CT? Um, our growth per year is about 10%. We're seeing uh, similar numbers across the, the United States. We are now uh, servicing patients that were never uh, originally with FDG intended to come to our cameras, prostate for, uh, for example. And so we have to get uh, really efficient. Optimization becomes incredibly important. Um, we, we need to maintain, I can't just stay another day because the Department of Health will go, uh, uh, uh. So we've got the work, that, the work that we can do within the days that we said we can do it. We can stretch out our hours of operations, but when we've hit the max, we've hit the max. So we want to keep that quality and satisfaction at that level at 96, really important to us, but we got to figure out how to serve a growing population um, that primarily our health systems want to keep within their systems. So again, our patients love us. They tell us less time on the table. Now we start seeing something that we can work on, right? How do we make that happen? Just one component of our scan more efficient and possibly we can get four or five more patients through that system in a day. That is our goal. Um, Shields Health has a long history of embracing innovation to be able to evolve and improve, and this is yet one more step to be able to do that. So we are in a phase one launch right now of Subtle Pet. Our intent is to be able to use it at all 18 locations. And I'm now going to allow Haley Camerata to tell us uh, exactly how her team is using this tool, and she's got the sexy images to show you. So I'm going to get out of your hair right now and let her do that. And this is actually your first slide, right? Okay. Thank you. All right, so with Subtle Pet, we have cut our scan time in half, which is huge. This is allowing us to see at least four to six more patients a day. 
Um, those protocols that are naturally longer, such as the DOTA tape scanning with gallium-68 and the, the new DetectNet, Copper-64, are automatically scheduled with Subtle Pet, decreasing a 50-minute scan down to 25 minutes. Along with increasing our throughput, we are improving the experience for our physicians, our technologists, and of course, the patients. Um, every patient is much more satisfied with a quicker scan time, and our technologists enjoy the ability to use Subtle Pet on any patient based on their condition. A patient that is highly claustrophobic or that is in severe pain and discomfort is always going to benefit from the rapid scan times of Subtle Pet. So as we walk through some of our case studies, we will show the quality that Subtle Pet provides. Whoops. So this is a quick comparison. Our standard um, protocol of two minutes of bed on the left there versus the one minute of bed processed with Subtle Pet. One can argue they are virtually the same. If not, the subtle pet image uh, has increased the pet quality. And again here. I will expand on this a little bit later, but it's important to note that small nodule in the left lung here, subtle pet is able to resolve that. So the faster you scan, the noisier images will be. It's a very common theme for all of the presentations today. So here is a one minute per bed scan time that our radiologists tell us is not diagnostic. That means it is impossible for them to use this image to create a final report. This is the same scan, one minute a bed, but processed and enhanced with subtle PET. Compared to our standard protocol of two minutes a bed, these two are diagnostically equivalent. Before Subtle Pet, we have been unable to decrease our scan time below two minutes of bed because of that loss of quality. This image on the very left here is very noisy. Enhanced with Subtle Pet, same image, one minute per bed. Again, diagnostically equivalent of our scan here of our standard protocol, two minutes of bed. It's also important to note that as we are using Subtle Pet, we are not losing any accuracy or definition. Again, this image on the left is one minute per bed. It's hard to tell in the PowerPoint, but you can see all of the graininess here in the liver and up throughout the scan is not noticed at all on the enhanced Subtle Pet image, which again is diagnostically equivalent or one could argue better quality than our standard protocol. So this is a 69-year-old female that presented to us, <clears throat> excuse me, due to a suspicious lung, lung CT screening. We have a cooperative approach with our partnerships, in this case thoracic surgery, who are looking for nodules four to six millimeters and high pretest probability patients. Subtle Pet has satisfied the ability to detect and resolve those. This is a 64-year-old female with known breast cancer, high probability of metastatic disease. In this case, utilizing Subtle Pet, one minute per bed, we were able to detect a seven millimeter and a 10 millimeter nodule in the lungs, answering the question, is there metastatic disease? So feel free to take a picture of our contact information up there. Um, you can reach out to us for any questions. Subtle Pet has been extremely exciting for us. With this one tool, we have been able to increase our throughput with um, continuing to provide high quality images and creating a um, great experience for our patients. Thanks to both of you. That was a very impressive presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Ryan Lee, my friend, Dr. Ryan Lee, who is the chair of the Department of Radiology at the Einstein Healthcare Network, which is now part of Jefferson Health. Dr. Lee. Thank you, Larry. And thank you to Subtle for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. What I'd like to talk about today is really part of the DNA of what Subtle does, and it's the workflow part of AI. And what I'd like to highlight is just a few things. I think at RSNA, what we've really seen, and we've seen this across the board at other societies, we see a lot of the, perhaps a good way to put it, the sexy algorithms. And those are the algorithms that evaluate disease states, and those are extremely important. But what Subtle has done here, and a lot of other vendors are starting to do as well, is look at the non-diagnostic sort of diagnostic 
images. And how can that change radiology? In, in fact, I think it has the possibility of being more transformative in many ways than the so-called pixel-based, really diagnostic algorithms. And you can see here, I just have a, a life cycle of what the modern radiologist does. Modern radiologist does way more than just simply look at an images and interpret. There's all kinds of things right from the beginning, from ordering to protocoling acquisition, which we're going to talk about, and of course, interpreting and reporting. Finally, communication and peer review. And AI can touch every one of these things. If you notice, only two of those boxes are actually related to the diagnosis of the, of the pathology itself. And of course, we'll have to at least acknowledge the diagnostic AI algorithms. And there is a plethora. I mean, these are some of the ones that we have deployed our network. And you can see there are many of them. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on these. There's so many of them, in fact, that it's, it's probably a good thing to try to standardize how you absorb these as a radiologist or as any healthcare profession, how you absorb these algorithms. And there are certainly different ways to do it. Let's do a standardized PACS, which is what we look at 95% of the time when we're looking at a workstation, perhaps through a dictation system, or perhaps through a third party vendor that might be large enough. All these are ways to absorb and actually have on the back end ancillary benefits instead of having to do go through legal and security and separate contracts with all these various vendors, you can do it instantaneously with just one common company. But let's move on to the non sort of pixel based or diagnostic algorithms. And you see I've highlighted ordering, scheduling, and acquisition. And these are really, the, I would like to say non pixel based, but really what Subtle does is it's actually looking and enhancing images or perhaps allowing you to decrease time. And you've seen a lot of pretty images, and so I won't belabor that point. We can see that you have really two buckets, right, with when you're using deep learning to improve these images. You can improve the quality or you can decrease the time. And so one of the things, upcoming things that we're going to be collaborating with, with Subtle, as well as another company called Equium, is to see if we can leverage all these and put things together in an interesting fashion. In our hospital-based MR units, and I'm sure many of this applies to the facilities you have, our hospital-based units have multiple duties. They not only have to take care of outpatients, which we're scheduling prospectively, but they also have to deal with ED and inpatients, which can be at any time. Right? They, the ED could at any time order a core compression study for somebody that comes in. So what happens? Well, you have those scheduled outpatients, and unfortunately, those outpatients may have to be delayed. In fact, you're going to have to tell someone, unfortunately, we have an emergency in the ED, so we're not going to be able to do it immediately. Now, what usually happens? Well, in our system, and I suspect it's probably similar at many systems, the technologist just makes an ad hoc decision. I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith, you're going to have to wait. Which scanner should I put on? Should I put it on the 3? Should I put it on the 1.5? You can imagine with an ad hoc system like that, there's a lot of inefficiency. What if we used the power of subtle to one, reduce the scan time, so to reduce the waiting when that happens, and two, look at another workflow, uh, non-pixel-based algorithm that can potentially help us intelligently reorder our patients in real time. So what you see here is without using any of this, whether it's subtle or using any intelligent scheduling, you can see that it's pretty full. It's inefficient, the scans are taking too long, the, 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 inpa the outpatients are scheduled almost back to back. What happens, however, if we use subtle and to decrease the amount of scan time? Now we've opened up some slots, and what you see here is you see that there are some empty spaces between, between the patients now. Well, that presents opportunity. However, the opportunity is not evident yet because we still have to figure out how we're going to get these individual patients in. Those are small scan times. So we've now accomplished a decreased scan time, but we now have to figure out how we're going to get those additional patients in. Well, with intelligent scheduling, you can now rearrange patients in the most effective way possible to optimize now your scheduling so that a technologist isn't left out to hang and having to make these ad hoc decisions. You can have a robust real-time reorganization. So taking advantage of both the scheduling as well as the decreased scan time that the deep learning software that Subtle offers can be very powerful. So that's something that we're, we have, uh, we're very enthusiastic and very optimistic about starting. But I want to highlight some other not workflow related things, which again, I think can transform. You'll see there are various vendors that may be able to generate impressions based on what's in the report, as well as looking at the historical style of the, of the radiologist, and even taking into account uh, what the history of the patient is. And this can decrease burnout, this can increase wellness, 
so many different opportunities. In fact, last year we presented at RSNA. We presented looking at those impressions generated by this type of software and having a radiologist blinded to an actual uh, impression generated by, by radiologists, and they could not tell the people that were involved. The p-value was very high. And so these can be very powerful tools to improve your workflow. And there's more and more the discussion of communication. How can we close the loop? How can we get the information to the providers and to the patients and know that they've received it? Well, using technology such as NLP, we can actually try to mine the data that's already in the report and send notifications to the patient. And we actually last year did a pilot project with a startup vendor that showed that you can improve the actual number of follow-up studies. And this year, I didn't want to put it on here, but it was, it's being presented that we showed a 25% improvement when we did a, a randomized control prospective study. So technology such as this can really affect how the reports that we generate as radiologists will actually be able to, to get to the patients effectively. In the, con in the realm of peer review, you know, now that you saw that there's so many different types of algorithms out there, how do we even know that they're working properly? Well, there isn't so far a good one robust way to do it, but as we move along, we're going to want to see how these algorithms are performing and having a common dashboard that can clinically, that can evaluate how the clinical performances of an algorithm relative to a report will be, I think it will be very important. And if you can see this over real time, imagine how you can see if something goes wrong, if there is more disc uh, non-congruity of the, of the uh, algorithms that perhaps something's wrong. We don't necessarily know at this point what's wrong, but we know that maybe perhaps the demographics change, maybe the inputs change, maybe the radiology are being changed. Something may have happened, and at least it gives you some measure of how these algorithms are working. So uh, several vendors are now starting to look at this, and I think that's going to be very important that we evaluate these algorithms in a similar way that we evaluate ourselves with peer review. And finally, although this is Pixel-based, this is kind of a different application of AI in the population health realm when it's very important to involve our colleagues in other specialties. And for example, lung nodule identification, partnering with pulmonology, or coronary artery calcification detected incidentally, and bone de demineralization uh, detected incidentally, partnering with our colleagues in cardiology or, or rheumatology. And looking at aortic succession in an accountable care organization, perhaps we want to see these things prospectively even in a non-urgent uh, setting. So in summary, the, the ability of AI to be used in the pixel-based and the diagnostic is clear. But some of these other things, including workflow management, decrease in scan times to get our patients through quicker, may be very important in the future. Thank you. So I have two pieces of good news. One is we finished in time to take some questions. And the, good, the, the second piece of good news is as you walk out, the food is actually there. So it is there for you. So any question for any of our speakers, and I'll remind the speakers that if you care to answer, the microphone is right here. Anyone? Uh, I see a finger pointing in a direction. I don't see a, I don't see a, I think you're trying to tell me to send them to the microphone. Yeah, there you go. Questions. Yeah. Any questions from anyone in the room? So um, you mentioned, the folks from Shields mentioned that when we do, do these, it can either be faster or better, right? I think, I think you made that statement. Um, but I think you probably, several times you actually said the images are actually perhaps a little bit better. I mentioned that I deliberately aim for better. And that's not hard to do, right? You can just use a higher imaging matrix. You can accelerate by reducing the next or use higher level parallel imaging. And, in general, you know, the, fat, the, the more your scanner is capable of accelerating with parallel imaging, the more that subtle medical software, subtle MR software is going to give you the ability to restore that signal and accelerate. So interestingly enough, the faster you can scan, the better, you're, you know, the faster you're, these, this software will help you. But we always aim at a higher resolution by putting higher matrices in or smaller fields of view in or sometimes thinner slices in. So would you say that, you know, if, in retrospect, would you say that you actually do you aim at a slightly better quality for these circumstances? Yes, yeah. Uh, oh, the answer was absolutely. Is there a question? Could you take it to the microphone, please? Would you mind? I think there are other folks listening. If you wouldn't mind taking that to the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the great insights and presentations. Um, you. Um, 
rightly elaborated a lot of the um, on uh, on the benefits for patients. I was um, wondering what your impression is um, of uh, patients regarding AI in general. Is there um, do, do they trust this technology, or are there um, concerns, probably? That would be great to, to hear your perspective You know, on that. it's an interesting thing. I think most surveys that have been done have said that patients have been anxious, that, you know, that anxious to adopt artificial intelligence augmentation of their health care. Um, the biggest challenge that I find is the radiologists are concerned, right? There was, there's a lot of worry, and you know, because there's been a very well-publicized experiments where they use virtually no data, and created an image, and sometimes, you know, if in the appropriate, with the appropriate perturbations can deliver artifacts in the images or fake findings in the images. The level of acceleration that you're seeing here and the level of augmentation you're seeing here is so, no pun intended, subtle compared to those that there really is none of that kind of concern in these particular cases. So one of the reasons, one of the ways that I, I reasons I presented things the way I did, and I frequently do the way I do when I talk about deep learning reconstruction, is to answer those concerns. Is this just a filter? Well, notice the resolution is actually higher, right? Are we losing anything? That's why when we do research, we do side-by-side -side comparisons. You know, you can't just say this image looks good or this image looks good, but when you do side-by-side -side comparisons, you can look carefully for are there perturbations? Have we lost anything? Have we created anything? And our experience, and I think the experience of radiologists as, they, as this becomes standard of care, has been very, very reassuring in that, in that aspect. Ryan, you want to have a question? Go ahead and grab them. Or you want to answer? Just grab the mic. It's right here. You don't have to come up here. You just don't do it from there. I think that's a, the, just to answer, to put in my uh, thoughts on this, it's a very good question about what pa patients think as well, because I don't think we do a very good job as radiologists actually to promoting to let all of our patients know. In fact, we were talking about this at another session. What are the ethics behind what should we be telling patients? Should this be going to the protocol that we should say that we're using uh, AI in whatever capacity it is? And I think that's a very good question for future. I don't think that there's an answer to it, but it's a very good question that perhaps we should be much more explicit in, in uh, letting patients know. Well, you know, Ryan is very active with the ACR, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a shot across your bow right now, Ryan. And there are folks right now that are directly marketing the AI to patients and uh, saying that we can bring the power of AI to bear on your exam. There is no reimbursement for this, but for a set amount of additional dollars, you will have a full multimodal artificial intelligence battery of tests that will be added to your study from risk assessment through uh, image interpretation. Are you willing to pay this additional stipend? And in our limited pilot rollouts, there was roughly a 30% adaption of that technology. So. Um, you know, it's even it's without all the reimbursement. Uh, specifically, out of pocket payment patients to get a better study out of it, and uh, it's early, and uh, I'm sure there'll be many more examples. But you know, it's going on out there. There is awareness, and and there is at least in some willingness to pay for the better quality that artificial intelligence can bring to the process. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks for the excellent session. Um, just on that note, uh, we're, we're a company. We're developing a, a tool to, to do that population screening for osteoporosis with x-rays themselves. And, and really, the value for that provider is the increase in DEXA utilization. But um, just that's a bit beside the point. Just wanted to uh, ask a, a quick question about the, the, synth the synthesized um, uh, subtle synth. It, really, like, what's the intended use there? Is, it, is the overall goal to essentially eliminate the gadolinium, or is it to be used in the setting where that gadolinium could not be administered because of patient factors? Uh, I think we can all take it, but I'm going to ask Greg, Greg to go first. So just to be clear, the initial subtle synth product is really aimed at cervical sp or at, at spine imaging, looking at STIR because it's such a crucial um, thing. The general synth product long term, uh, I, I view as a very flexible modality. Um, I personally don't feel, you know, I, I have done a lot of work looking at, you know, gadolinium imaging and low-dose gadolinium imaging and zero-dose gadolinium imaging, and I think this is hard. I think it's really hard, and I think the FDA will consider it really hard. So I don't see that as the primary use case. I think the primary use case is for uh, studies that are motion degraded, studies in which a patient leaves prematurely and where you have nothing, and rather than have nothing, you'll have a synthesized image. And I think that that is a, a favorable uh, sort of risk-benefit profile at this time. I'm not saying that long-term that these technologies might be used more 
uh, extensively for gadolinium, whether it's people who just can't get GAD yeah. or people who, you know, just get it so much that they don't want it, et cetera. I mean, I, I'd be totally honest with you. I mean, I think from a diagnostic perspective, gadolinium is super useful and contributes very unique information. Yeah. Um, but I do worry about things like environmental long term. And I think that's why we focus so much on low dose, because, um, you know, really, when you think about it, low dose is just another denoising technique, and we're pretty good at denoising. So I have a couple of perspectives on that. So uh, I think your initial question was about subtle GED, uh, and um, uh, and you heard really concerns uh, responses from both of us suggesting that less gadolinium into the patient and less gadolinium into the environment are both good things. And this is a theme that you're going to hear a lot more now that there are high relaxivity contrast agents approved. I'm sure you've seen some of them at the booth. And you know, rather than touting the, the super capability of high relaxivity, both vendors have gone to the FDA and have come out with an approach that said, we're going to give this at half dose and get equal efficacy. And really, the benefit there would be just in terms of patient retention and environmental exposure. So you know, these ideas are themes you're going to hear a lot more about. I think there is a reason there is a reasonable groundswell of, of concern over these issues. At least um, we've all been concerned about deposition. The Europeans have been more concerned about the environment, but I think that's starting to spread here. And uh, I, the concepts in your mind are, are going to be in everyone's mind over the next few years. Just one more follow-up. Go right ahead. Unless there's another question. Just uh, regarding the, the this efficiency boost, do you foresee a future where we can take a fundamental, like you take the fundamental T1, T2 weighted sequences uh, at volumetric resolution and then just reconstruct everything else that we that we like to look at for diagnostic purposes? A, do you think a that's a possible? A future, a future? Yeah. Let's take a walk around the booth right now. Um, you know, virtually everybody does a... a on 3T, there's a volumetric T1 and reformats all three planes. That's there. Right. right. And then, but what about the, like, the additional sequences that we liked, like the stir and all Yeah. Those so let's, let's get back. Sure. That could certainly be something that they might be able to work on. I mean, it seems to me that they can do that. Um, I actually like another use case for the stir. Thank you for reminding me. Um, which is the same thing that I thought of when, we, when synthetic MRI first came out, right? You know, it was marketed for the brain, but there's lots of ways to go fast. You know, it's marketed for quantification. We don't do that kind of thing in clinical practice um, and segmentation, but it uh, wasn't marketed for other areas like musculoskeletal imaging where I get a T1 and T2, but gee, I would, take, I would look at a stir if I had one. You know, and there were other things. So you would throw this in as an additional view to see if you could increase the conspicuity of pathology, even if you weren't going to do that ordinarily. So it could theoretically improve your diagnostic capabilities and acumen by increasing the conspicuity of some findings by giving you a stir that you might ordinarily not acquire. So I think all the use cases that Greg mentioned are really solid. I wouldn't have thought about them you know, clearly, at least not after getting up at four in the morning to prepare for today's talks, but they are solid. But I, you know, the one I always imagine is, wouldn't you like a stir here? Yeah. Why don't you get one? Well, it takes too long. Well, this might give you the opportunity for that. And I think MSK, where they frequently do the same thing at multiple contrasts, right? You can do that. The spine is an obvious circumstance, so I think the future will be in those areas as well. All right, we are over our time, and we probably aren't supposed to be. Uh, if food is outside, please go ahead and enjoy it. And I, all of us who put this time together, as well as the sponsor of this program, appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Thank you.